we're going to focus on hydrilla and a little history about the plant and our efforts here on the lake. You're not going to see a whole lot today because of the treatment, recent treatment efforts and the severe cold that we've had again this year, but it's here. Uh, I think Ed said in the previous talk he estimated about 10,000 acres uh, prior to our treatment efforts this year. Uh, hydrilla was introduced to Florida in the 1950s by the aquarium trade. Uh, some tropical fish dealers in Tampa and Miami planted it in nearby canals and retention ponds. And in 20 years, it grew from uh, those isolated plantings to pretty much best most of the larger water bodies in Florida. No sexual reproduction. Uh, well, unfortunately, Science proved us wrong. This is the first documented case of resistance in the species of asexual reproduction. Mm -hmm. There are naturally occurring mutations in, in amino acids in the DNA structure that selected or uh, produced plants that were more tolerant to the, the uh, herbicide sonar. Our treatment efforts year after year after year with the same product selected for those more tolerant strains. So we essentially eliminated all the susceptible plants and we were left with the tolerant plants. Initially, we could keep bumping up the concentration to control the plants, but it got to the point that it was cost prohibitive and the concentrations were so high that they were starting to impact the native vegetation as well. So around 2000, we started scratching our heads trying to figure out what to do. Uh, for the next several years, like I said, they just bumped up the concentrations to continue managing the floor at all. They uh, discovered through research that they could use another product in the thaw on a large scale, which had not been the case previously. It was primarily for spot treatments. And body. So they figured out how to use that on a large scale. That's what's been used on Toho uh, since 2004, pretty much exclusively. We have some new products on the market now. It takes several years to figure out how to use them effectively in large systems so we don't have a good tool. conditions produced over 3,000 inches of growth in one month. So that's how we can go from a situation like what we see now to a situation like what you have in the, in the photos. The Those photos line. were taken right out here. You can see the power lines in the background of the pictures. Mm -hmm. And that's what it typically looks like in the summertime. That's surface mat of hydrilla. Hey, Kim, you, you hold, yeah, just hold, hold it, sure. Now, because of the snail kite and the endangered species treatment okay, protocols you, have been modified in recent years, and that's the other image there, uh, what's in white is what's been treated the last several years. Is equal okay, to let me come back. Wait a minute. I'm getting, I'm taking my time. Let me do a banner. The colored trails oh, through the white. Get that glare off of there for me. Uh, the situation mm -hmm. there is Thank snail you, kites feed exclusively on apple snails. And we have the exotic apple, one of the exotic apple snails here in Toho. Uh, so in, in an attempt to produce more snails for the kites, we're leaving more hydrilla because the snails prefer the hydrilla in this mm -hmm. habitat for the snails. So until the Everglade habitat recovers where the snail kites can move back down there, uh, the majority of the nesting for the snail kites occurs right here on Toyota. Mm -hmm. Who monitors the snails? Uh, they have a group from UF that does a lot of monitoring, and then FWC also has a snail kite coordinator. So they, FWC kind of, 
coordinates the efforts between the University, Florida Fish and Wildlife, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Okay. We also have people from the University of West Florida mm -hmm. that are looking specifically at the snails. So we've got a group looking at kites, another one looking at snails, snails. and kites, and a third one looking at snails.